And um, when I say follow up, it's always nice to see some of the things that you've now processed. What I'd like to do is just um, take you out uh, into the city and show you some things. By the way, we showed that little bronze map last week. And uh, there it is. I don't think I showed you a picture of it in, in terms of the, the direction you see the city from as you're looking at the map. How many are my Jerusalem people here? Let me see. So you've all looked at that. You've all stood at that bronze map and the tree that are like it. You've looked out there and said, by golly, the temple's right there, and by golly, the temple's right there. It was really a great uh, learning experience. Um, uh, and so last week, we kind of had the preliminary into this, and, and we kind of thrashed it through, and now you've read about it. Um, I wanted to point out once again, just to make sure that you understood that the, the, the proposition is not an absolute certainty. Um, there are times I don't know my name with certainty. But the, the, um, the, the probabilities in view of putting together the preponderance of evidence for a place in Jerusalem would lead toward a place uh, where uh, those of, uh, of northern heritage would be more likely to have real estate and that would be in what um, Second Kings calls the college, if you read the King James Version. It says that Hulda the prophetess dwelt in the college, which is weird. You know, was she a co-ed? <laughs> uh, the projector is overheated. Just, it'll turn off. It'll it go away. You're fine. <laughs> Don't have to One more thing. <laughs> um, uh, why the King James scholars decided that they should uh, translate the Hebrew word Mishnah as college in this verse is a mystery. Because in Hebrew it says she dwelt in, the, in, in Jerusalem in the Mishnah. Now, um, in uh, Zephaniah, it's simply called the second. Which, you know, and, oh, and there will be a... a, a, a um, a howling from the second people. What does that mean? Uh, there was a separate, a different group of King James scholars translating Zephaniah than translated Second Kings. So when they came to this word, that they didn't really know exactly what it meant, because they don't know anything about you know systematic geography of Jerusalem. You get it two different ways in the book. The word does mean second or additional. Some of you have done Jewish studies, right? You know about the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the additional law, right? the, the oral Torah written down. Uh, the, the second law, as, you know, as, whereas Genesis or Deuteronomy is the first law, the first Torah. In this case, it's not referring to a second law, it's referring to a second neighborhood outside the city walls, whereas this thing had become the, the first big neighborhood. And that's why, uh, presumably, it was called the, the, the Mishnah, which, of course, was additional to the neighborhood that had started out as the Makdesh, but had spread all the way to the western hills. So Zephaniah mentions all three of these uh, categories. The early Makdesh here, it's spreading to the western hills, and the, um, the, the second. And it talks about how, you know, there will be, there will be uh, angst and fear and howling in Jerusalem from all of the portions of the city at the time that the, the siege comes. And that's the, 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 uh, the, the, the basis of the prophecy there. But it's different than, than Second Kings and, and the translation of Mishnah's college. Uh, here, at least, it makes some second, some, some uh, uh, sense if you, uh, if you understand the Hebrew particles. Here, you know, I'm left to wonder what they were thinking, but uh, probably no matter. Um, so I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. Now, when we mentioned last week, and I, I hope you saw this now, that this was a gate area. This was the northern gate area. And something that had happened in Lehi's time um, was that the, the dip that followed the natural um, topography here was deemed to be a weakness in the um, in the line of the wall. So probably during the reign of Josiah, another portion was added right here, and the gateway narrowed, and a, uh, and a protective tower was built. So whereas in King Hezekiah's time, that's how the wall looked, 
by Josiah and Lehi's time, this is how it looked. And this wall was actually more or less inside the gate. And you came in and accessed a separate gate that probably ran right through there. So uh, when I intimated to you last week that maybe you know you could imagine Nephi hiding outside this wall, we'd have to put that 15 meters this way because this little mix in here would have actually been inside that other newer wall. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I said that, lest some of you that are really, really bright figure it out for yourself and think I haven't thought of it. Um, okay. Uh, so, as we say, uh, there in what is now the Jewish quarter would be the general area of the ancient Mishnah. And uh, we hope that you'll get to visit someday. We hope when you're wandering around in Jerusalem that uh, of all the things that you think of when you're there, you don't forget to think of the Book of Mormon and how it starts out in Jerusalem. Um, now, uh, in this study, you also read about the four-room house, which uh, is the old name for it. Nowadays, uh, we who do archaeology, when we're... Um, when we're talking about this, this Iron Age Israelite house style that we find literally everywhere, uh, we will more often call it the pillared courtyard house. Because also, although the basic design does feature four rooms, and uh, those rooms kind of work like this, uh, this would be one room, second room, third room, and a fourth room across the back, okay? Um, that's why they call it the four-room house. But the middle room was always the entry court, and, and very often it would have been open to the air, like, a, like an outdoor patio. Um, uh, but but uh, uh, very often you would also find variations on this that maybe uh, if there was only a small area, they would build the, the, uh, the, the back room and only have two forward rooms coming instead of three. So you get little variations on it. So, uh, Oh, probably 20 years ago, the, the nomenclature changed a little bit. We began to talk about the pillar and courthouse rather than the four-room house, although still both exist in the literature. And uh, this hypothetical drawing that you had in the um, in the article in the, in the chapter shows basically the back room here divided into two perhaps living spaces, and then the front three uh, uh, rooms. One, of course, being the entry court here and then the others being uh, used for domestic purposes here, but also for um, storage or stabling purposes. Because you could keep, uh, say, your, um, uh, your chickens, or your, um, uh, uh, if you owned a, a goat for milk, or even if you owned a donkey, you could, you could stable them, actually, in part of, of one of the four rooms. You could divide these and subdivide them however you like. You could also put second floors on them. Uh, we know that we have uh, uh, whole houses like this that have a second floor over this area, this area, and this area. The one that I depicted has a second floor only extending out halfway over here. This was a very flexible type of a house design to use. Uh, but the basic, uh, um, the basic design is very, very familiar everywhere we go. Now, some of you that have had the chance to visit Israel will probably have visited Tel Sheva in the south, Tel Be'er Sheva on one of your field trips, and there you walk past a dozen of these that were excavated, but also restored so visitors could see what they're like. This is the famous basement house where the end room there, uh, room four, actually had a basement to it. Uh, but here on the side, you have two, uh, uh, two sub-compartments in that one, uh, sub-compartments over here, and then the middle court right here with a very, very narrow doorway. Um, uh, one that I have excavated myself is this one. This is an aerial shot of, of, the, uh, of one of the areas that I uh, manage. And we, it's been excavated away, but part of the actual uh, uh, four-room house, one of the rooms here, another one here going into the vault, the central court with a pillar and with a mortar in it, and then un underneath the vault here, more of it that's, that's unexcavated. And then it actually ran out all the way to here, but we dug it away in this area. But this is, is a portion of, uh, of a Judean four-room house. Here's how we draw it in the plan, just so that you can see it. 
Uh, you can see the long room here, the long central court there, and here in an unexcavated area, what would be part of the other long area. So this is a this is a type that was used all over, and when we suggest that this is very likely the style of a house that Levi would have had, it's because we don't find any other styles in this age. Uh, everything is a variation of this particular style. So that's the drawing that we offered you to give you a kind of a three-dimensional uh, mock-up of what uh, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lehigh would have had in Jerusalem, where he went back and flopped down on his bed and had the second revelation of the day. Now, what's in these houses, okay? Um, well, anything that you stored, that you store today in plastic or glass or paper, or foil, or um, uh, you know, any type of container um, they stored in pottery. That was the only type of non-perishable container that you could make. Well, you could make metal, but it was, it was hugely expensive, and people just didn't make metal containers. Even cooking pots and broiling trays were made of clay. Even even baking trays were made of clay, made of pottery. Everything was made of pottery. And this is what we overwhelmingly find in the archaeological excavations, as any of you who've walked over those tells will know. There's just pottery scattered everywhere. Because the one thing about it is it's worse than plastic. It never biodegrades. Uh, but it's worse than plastic in another way, is that you can throw it on the ground and it will break immediately. You can throw a plastic bottle and it just won't break no matter how often you throw it down. But uh, you drop one of these vessels and they break in pieces. So this is what we find everywhere in all the layers of these places. This is a typical Iron Age II repertoire uh, from just one room that I excavated uh, back, oh, probably 12, 15, uh, uh, well, no, seven or eight years ago now, of uh, Judean pottery styles. And, and what we have here, and because we only find them in partial um, groups of pieces, when we reconstruct them, we have to kind of paste in where, uh, where the missing pieces are. You have a great big barrel here. This is what's called a barrel in the Bible. Remember when Elijah told the woman, the barrel of meal shall not fail? He wasn't talking about a wooden barrel with staves, like you see outside, you know, uh, Matt Dillon's saloon. Um, it was a barrel pithos like there, a huge uh, with multiple handles around it, a huge pot standing about this big, this round, full of grain that could then be milled into flour for the daily bread making. Uh, what did Elijah say in 2 Kings 17, the, 17? The barrel of meal shall not fail, and the cruise of oil shall not fail. There's the cruise right there, the, uh, the Iron Age II dipper jungle. Uh, a small vessel that you would you would specifically fill from a larger uh, pot like this uh, that would keep your supply of oil. Now we call this a closed vessel as opposed to this, which we call an open vessel, and that has to do with the size of the of the mouth. Okay? An open vessel is something you can easily reach down into, and, and you have to kind of protect because it's open to much more intrusion from the air. Closed vessel has a much smaller um, area where it, you actually have to, maybe you can reach in there with one hand and, and get a little jar and dip in there and bring the jar back out of the oil. Um, and there are other storage vessels uh, that you would have uh, uh, water. You always had a water pot in the home. You didn't have any running water, so you always had a pot of water. And you filled that pot of water every day from, uh, from skins that you took to the well or the spring of the city. Go and you would fill your water skin, bring it up, and dump it into your water pot uh, in your home. And then when you'd have the day's supply of fresh water. And maybe you had to do that more than once a day if you had a lot of water activity. So you had a pot of water, uh, salt, um, other uh, ingredients that you would use, uh, mixing dishes. Um, this is actually a cooking pot right here. Now the bottom of it is missing, but it's just one that I have sitting in my desk. I have a desk that's mine at Bar-Elon University in Tel Aviv, and it only gets used for like three months a year. 
but uh, this is the ornament on my desk. It's a cooking pot. They're about um, just a little smaller than this bucket. They have a round bottom, and you set them on a stove, and you can boil and cook anything in them. Uh, cereals, you know, grain cereals, uh, stews, boil eggs, make a uh, make a, uh, a stew and meat dish out of out of uh, poultry or or maybe lamb. Um, it, we find all kinds of, of uh, cooking pot designs, and this is the one that is known from Lehigh's day, with the ridges on the top and the two handles flaring out from the side. So this is the type of a thing that Soraya would have done a lot of cooking on. Uh, and when she made her bread, she would have gone into a barrel like this, and she would have used it, you know, then, then ground the, um, um, uh, the meal. The thing that you most often found in houses, and here's where I have brought some show and tells for you, is one of these. This is a clay lamp. This is actually real. I'm going to hand it around so you mustn't drop it. Because somehow this has survived for 2,600 years. It would be a shame if it, you know, went the way of the world now with this light down. Um, the reason it survived is that it was placed in a tomb, okay. uh, a, tomb a burial cave, uh, sometime in the old, between about 650 and 600 BC, because that's the particular style of this lamp. It's the, it's the uh, Iron Age 2C, late 7th century BC lamp, with not a round bottom, but a heavy disc bottom to keep the lamp from you know, tipping over. And they would fill the basin with oil, and they would put a wick made out of flax, a twisted wick here. It would come out the spout, and they would light that. You can see where the wick was burning right here, where, where actually there's burn marks there. Uh, this one survived uh, because it probably, well, well, I know for actual sure, that this was not used in a house, but it was placed in a tomb where there were burials. And when they would come to, to make another burial in a tomb, they would light these lamps. But since they were in a tomb, they were considered unclean, so they were always left there. They were never taken back to the homes. And so it has a lot of the type of limestone uh, uh, crud, patina accumulation on it that you get from, uh, from a burial cave where it's a very moist environment and it, it, it penetrates the site. But that's the beautiful red clay of Judea there. This is exactly the type of a lamp that you would have had in Jerusalem of the 600 BC uh, era with its olive oil, and in any room, two or three or more of these, you know, because they only burn one candle power, one flame. And so you need, in order to keep things light at night, you'll need a few of them in, in any room. And even when you go to bed, you leave one burning, so that you keep a flame going. And when you trim your lamp, what that means is you have to trim the charred wick and make sure there's more oil from your dipper jug in the lamp. Remember the book of Proverbs in 31 talks about the, the virtuous woman whose lamp goeth not out by night. So uh, rather than just look at stuff, here's something you get. By the way, this is on permanent loan to me from the Israel Antiquities Authority. I am not an antiquities pet. <laughs> um, now what else would you find in the house of Lehi? just to kind of bring this. Uh, and by the way, some of this stuff you would have to take into the wilderness with you because you got to cook. you got to store stuff. I mean, so, so some of this stuff is going to come with them, you know, uh, into the wilderness. Uh, this is how you do your bread. Um, this is a grinding stone. And this one is about, uh, oh, 80 centimeters long. It's about like this long. And... Uh, it's got a, a, this is the bottom stone, and this is the top here. And by the way, this is that pot that you saw, but this is when we dug it up. This is in the, uh, this is in the destruction level. This is what it was like when we excavated it and before we put it, and the dipper jugwood is right there. See? And uh, those other pots that you saw all put together, well, they're in this situation and not so, doing so well right now. Uh, but here is a small, uh, upper grinder that you can hold with one hand, 
a millstone. And here's the large millstone that you'd have to have two hands to push back and forth along this basalt, you know, volcanic stone grinder. This is the same type of dark gray stone that you find up north outside of Pocatello, volcanic basalt, because um, it's, it's very hard stone, much harder than limestone, and it's the better hard stone for crushing wheat and barley and making it into flour. The advantage of it is that it doesn't leave lime dust in your flour, which can poison you. And the other advantage is that when it does, on occasion, break off a little grit of the, of the, of the stone, it's dark enough that you can see in the sifting process. And you can get it out of your you know, flour before you bake your uh, pita, and then you crunch it and you go, how am I too? Uh, so these are basalt, and uh, so uh, the barrel of meal, which then is taken and ground to make the daily bread, shall not fail. And this is the type of a, my daughter actually excavated this. My daughter Renee, uh, one year back, this is seven years ago, helped excavate this, and there she's holding the top grinding stone and showing, you know, how it would be used. Just again, you grind that wheat. And this is something that uh, not only uh, Sariah, but the daughters of, uh, of Ishmael that married Nephi's sons, and presumably the daughters of Lehi that married Ishmael's sons, and uh, Mrs. Ishmael, and everybody else, you had to, to do this. This is how you, 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 you did your food. It's just daily life here. This is when, uh, this is back in 1994 when we had all 160 students at the Jerusalem Center go out and excavate the entire uh, uh, area that had been destroyed by the Babylonians when they destroyed Ekron in 604 BC. Um, uh, and Ekron's about 20 miles west of Jerusalem. The Babylonians that later destroyed Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar and his troops, destroyed this city. And, and here are some students then digging up um, a carafe, you know, a, a, a vessel that could be used uh, for uh, storing um, uh, wine wine carafe. Now, why is that interesting? Well, who'd been drinking wine in First Eve by one? Laban. He probably had a whole one of those. Because, because and, and Mormons don't usually know this, it's very hard to get drunk to the point of passing out with wine. Because it's, it's, it's fermented alcohol, it's fairly low amount of alcohol by volume. Um, and you have to drink a lot, a lot, a lot of it before you will pass out. It's not like a... In, in the Bible, you see two types of alcohol mentioned. Um, uh, wine and strong drink. Okay. Now, what is strong drink? It's what you would know as beer. Brewed alcohol. As opposed to fermented alcohol like wine. So there's wine and beer. The type of alcohol that you know as whiskey or vodka, which is distilled alcohol, hadn't been invented yet. And it wasn't invented until the, <coughs> our own Middle Ages. Okay? It's, it's only the, the technology for distilling alcohol is less than a thousand years old. Uh, so in antiquity, and this would be both Old Testament and New Testament times, strong drink was brewed alcohol, like beers, like the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Philistines had, or fermented alcohol, wine. But because they have a much lower alcohol by volume, you had to drink a whole Kool-Aid pitcher of it <coughs> in order to totally, you know, lose your, your, your senses. And so Laban had really been on a bender that night. Let's, let's, let's say that. He hadn't had just a couple of drinks. Yes. So I know this is later in the book one, we're talking about the but like all the time, the inside army say, hey, let's do the guards this drink and they'll fall asleep and all wake up and they will get by. Was that something that was similar to this that uh, no, every society on earth has learned how to ferment <laughs> alcohol, and most of them learned how to brew it, too. Okay. And uh, in ancient Mesoamerica, they had their own recipes, which incidentally involved chilies and chocolate. <laughs> Interesting taste combination. Uh, that are going to be much different by the time, say, of Alma and Helaman than they were in, in the Middle East in Nephi's day. But still, we'll see the name wine used for it in the English translation. Um, okay, so what else have I got here? So, okay, so come on. Uh, a couple of more uh, cooking pot styles here. 
See, you know how you can stack your Revere wear? Well, this is the this is Levi wear, and uh, and and, and uh, here is is um, a type of jar that's just just a little bit older than Levi. These date from about 700 BC in the time of Isaiah. These are the famous Lamellic jars, but they were still being used. Some of them a hundred years later, a hundred years after the reign of Hezekiah, we find some of these in uh, 600 BC contexts, showing that. If you didn't break it, a good pot could last a long time. And then there were these, these remarkably beautiful uh, decanter styles, some of them actually incised here. You can see that the, there is uh, our names on it. Yes, sir? Uh, it says that they take all manner of seeds of every kind with them. Mm -hmm. They take that in some of those larger sorts of pots. Well, seeds you can transport in something that's a little uh, uh, lighter. Rather than having to put them in a pot, you can take them in a basket, a woven basket or a woven bag. So I'm assuming that they probably had what we would, we would, would for us would be the equivalent of burlap sacks to take some of those dry goods with them, uh, including probably grain because it's not going to spoil in the desert. But uh, to cook, you can't use a sack. Right. And they didn't have foil, so they're going to have to have some pottery with them. Um, incidentally, you've heard of sackcloth and ashes, which is mentioned several times in the Old Testament. Uh, the actual word in Hebrew is sack. They don't say sackcloth, they just say sack, that you dress in sack. And it's, um, it's a really um, a coarse type of flax material that, that would be the equivalent of our burlap. Okay? So if you dressed in sackcloth and ashes, you were dressing in a... Uh, a really scratchy, itchy, not very nice uh, uh, shirt. And why would you do that? You only do it if you're mourning. You only do it if you're kind of, you know, punishing yourself or because you're sad. You didn't, you didn't wear burlap like regularly. Because normally it was used for these purposes, for, for, for seed uh, and for other dry storage. Um, okay, uh, a trip to the Israel Museum is always <coughs> the funnest place to go in Jerusalem. I'd like to show you some things here uh, relative to metalworking that you've read about. But before we do that, let's take uh, a three or four minute break because we're almost the same. So let's come back in two minutes after the hour, after you've had your drink, and we'll go to the museum.